Shalom and welcome to another episode in our series called The Life of Christ in Context. Today we will once again have Steve Hudson with us to present the chronology of Jesus during his last week in Jerusalem. I know this will be an exciting and eye-opening session with Steve as we retrace the footsteps of Jesus. We're glad that you're with us. Well, I'm excited about this session. It's our last session with guest presenter and good friend, Steve Hudson. Uh, we were classmates, actually, at JUC, Jerusalem University College, back in the early 80s. I can't believe so much time, Steve, has gone past now, but uh, we are really in for a treat today as we continue our conversation about the chronology of Jesus. So as I begin this session with Steve, and uh, let's just remind ourselves that, again, even this last session, as we talk about uh, what Jesus did, where he was, and certainly what happened to him in Jerusalem, I think applies to all of seeing Jesus through uh, these viewpoints, these perspectives, the historical, the geographical, the archaeological, of course, the chronological, uh, chronological, the cultural, and the soteriological. Uh, that's a big focus in this session as we, of course, talk about the completion of God's redemptive plan on the cross, Jesus giving his life for you and me. But uh, all of this is creating context, and I hope that you have had, had a chance to view the first two sessions with Steve as we walk through really the whole land of Israel, and uh, really captured a lot of uh, the essence of what you see on the screen uh, in terms of where he lived, who he was, what he did, where he taught, and so forth. But uh, today we uh, zero in with Steve on uh, this last week, commonly called the Passion Week of Christ. So, Steve, great to have you with us again. Fun to be with you again, too, John, and I love talking this chronology of the life of Jesus. And in the last couple of sessions, we looked at that chart that had the five phases, and we talked in terms of those first 30 years, that preparation period, very little written about Jesus after the birth narratives, just that one example of him probably at the end of his 12th year heading to the temple where he got left behind. And then that second phase with ministry foundations that started with his baptism when he was 30 years old, then right into the wilderness, then calling those first followers who had been following John the Baptist. And the end of that, uh, you know, 18 to 21 months was when he was rejected at Nazareth in the sermon that he gave in the synagogue on that Sunday. And then we looked at ministry training and expanded outreach. And there Jesus really uh, started to call those guys to a closer walk. And he said, I'm not asking for leaders. I really want workers. The harvest is plentiful. Uh, the laborers, the workers are few. And he says, I want to change your orientation from just what's in it for me to how can I be involved in other people's lives? So you have been following me, but now my new challenge is following fish. And he got him fishing, John. He got him in those six fishing trips, right one after another that Luke talks about in a great chronological order, Luke chapter four and Luke chapter five. And uh, then at the end of that time, we're now two and a half years in. Um, that's when he actually calls the 12. And that's when he starts that leadership multiplication that starts with the Sermon on the Mount. And he called all of his disciples to him. And from them, he chose the 12 who are now, now named apostles. And these last 15 months, uh, we traced that in our last session. And uh, eventually that brought him now right up to uh, Jerusalem. 
He had spent the night before this probably down in Jericho, and you see that he comes up to Jerusalem getting ready for um, what we now know as Passion Week and Palm Sunday and his triumphal entry. John, I'm not sure when he got up there, but when he did get up, you'll see on that map that's coming up that um, he makes Bethany his home area as he uh, heads up to Jerusalem. And as he spends that time in Bethany, I think maybe he got up there maybe on that Friday uh, or later in the Gospels. It talks about six days before, you know, the Passover meal. So maybe he got up to Bethlehem, Bethany on Friday mm -hmm. and then uh, just took Shabbat, Sabbath, uh, purified himself and got ready for what was going to be a very busy week. So. We see uh, uh, him now thinking in terms of Palm Sunday. You see that Mount of Olives in the bottom right-hand side of the picture. And Bethany just off the map to the right of the Mount of Olives. We'll see some pictures on that coming up within two miles of the old city, according to the gospel. So not a very long walk at all. And I know, John, you and I have made that walk at different times through mm -hmm. the years. And uh, it doesn't take that long to do. So Sunday hits. And uh, when we get to Sunday, he starts out at Bethany. And um, all of a sudden, he moves. And uh, as he moves on Sunday, um, we know that he uh, first goes to, he sends his disciples ahead of him to Bethpage. And there he's going to tell them he needs a donkey. And um, so Bethany, you've got circled, and then mm -hmm. uh, Bethpage, and uh, then uh, he starts to make his way into Jerusalem, and uh, the old city of which uh, the the Herod's uh, outer wall around the temple compound still stands to this day, over two thousand years later. It's just magnificent that way, and so as he starts to come up over the hill, riding that donkey. Um, this is kind of the view that he's going to get from the top of that hill where you're showing that, John, and looking down at the Temple Mount area that's right in the top of your picture in the middle. So he crests that hill and uh, think of what's happening there. People are laying down all of their cloaks. They're laying palm branches, which really showed the last time when the Maccabees on the coins, when the Maccabees overthrew the Greeks, um, they had coins that talked about uh, these palm branches were a signal of their deliverance. And people are calling him king. And uh, they're singing psalms talking about that. And it is just pretty amazing what's going on. And John, uh, you have to read the Gospels, but when you look at them, you see that crowds are coming from three different sources. Some right from Bethany itself, because they knew what had happened earlier with Lazarus and with uh, his resurrection by Jesus. And they had been around that area and they knew what was going on. They knew Jesus was there. Then you had pilgrims that were still streaming into the city. That's a second source. And then the Gospels say that people are coming out from Jerusalem itself because they know Jesus is in Bethany. So we can't imagine the thousands and thousands that would have thronged from multiple directions. And Jesus would have pressed it up over that hill. And really, John, I mean, from Bethpage, where he got on the donkey to the crest of the hill, is no more than two to 300 yards. Mm -hmm. It's not very far. And he gets to the top and he's looking down just kind of what your arrow is showing into that classic view of the mm -hmm. old city of Jerusalem. And uh, he would have gone through the cities of Bethpage like your illustration there. And we just don't understand how tumultuous a time. We can't fathom that. By the way, he got on the donkey at Bethpage because that was considered the outer limits of the city of Jerusalem. And so he came riding in from the outer limits as he entered that city and he came riding in as a suffering servant, not on a big war horse or anything. And these people would have recognized too when David was about dead and his son Adonijah was trying to take over uh, uh, you know, at the spur of the moment, 
he was down at the Gihon Spring, and that's when David had his donkey saddled and taken down there for Solomon to ride in. So all of this symbolism, Jesus would have seen this view right here. Uh, you wouldn't have had the gold dome of the rock. You would have had the temple, which most scholars say would have been at least two times as tall as that uh, dome of the rock is now. And that whole outside retaining wall, it's exactly as it was 2,000 years ago. And so Jesus would have seen that. He comes down over the hill, and that's when he starts to um, weep over the city of Jerusalem. John, you want to talk just briefly a little bit about Dominus Flevit? Yeah, as we typically with our groups, I'm sure your groups as well, Steve, in every really group in the world, uh, they walk down the Palm Sunday Road. And of course, we don't know where specifically that may be, but there's a nice, actually rather steep road. And we pass by and actually visit this church. Again, it's another one of these chapels designed by guy named Barluzzi, an Italian in the 30s, but it preserves where, uh, and I find the the relationship between, at one moment, Steve, uh, uh, proclaiming Jesus as king and palm branches and all of this, and of course the religious leaders want everything to be quieted down because I'm sure they were uh, not wanting the, the Romans to, to deal with this, what may appear to be an uprising. But right after that, he weeps over Jerusalem. I just think the relationship between proclaiming king and then almost the next few verses, he's crying over Jerusalem because he knows what will take place uh, within one generation. Uh, here's another uh, different view of this chapel. Uh, really, the chapel is a really nice place to visit. The acoustics are great. We usually sing a song or two in there, and looking out uh, this window, it's a beautiful cross, and the, the, the image is quite spectacular. But from the grounds of Dominus Flevit, Steve, we can see the eastern wall, and just over to the right, just off the picture, is the eastern gate. But what a view this must have been of the temple itself. And Jesus... Uh, when that word, that Greek word for weeping, crying over Jerusalem, it's not a gentle little crying. It's an uncontrollable so uh, sobbing. It's, it's a wailing loudly. And so like you, John, I see that juxtaposed with at the crest of the hill, everyone, you know, singing psalms and praising and saying our Messiah has come, and they're thinking a political leader, and Jesus, like you said, is going, little do you know, I keep trying to prepare my disciples. I've done it three times overtly already and told mm. them what's going to happen, but I know you guys don't get that yet. We sometimes forget, John, we just think triumphal entry and Sunday, and that was it, but he also on that Sunday went down into the temple, and he healed those that were lame and blind and it says at the end of the gospel passages there um, in a couple of the different gospels that he looked around. And I always found that intriguing. He looked around. It's not like Jesus was a sightseer. It's not like when you and I bring groups and people have never, ever been up on Temple Mount. They've never seen that before. What was he looking at? And I think the next day will give us some uh, hints on that. Well, he's back to Bethany for the night. And um, when he wakes up the next morning, he crosses the Mount of Olives. Again, we see that in your picture. So he's back and forth and back and forth this whole week. Uh, Bethany is home base. By the way, John, I don't know if you've come across it, but um, there is a book that I have really enjoyed through the years. And it's called, um, I think it's called The City That God Most Loved. It's something like that. And it's Frank Viola. And he's basically looking at all the different things that happen in Bethany in the context of Jesus' relationship with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus and how he felt like that was one of the most comfortable places and one of the most endearing places where Jesus could spend time and just be himself. So he's back the next morning. And as he comes back, it's Monday now, and he sees this uh, fig tree. 
and you've got a great picture of a fig tree. It's leafy, it's in bloom, it looks wonderful, but it doesn't have the full fruit at all to it. And he curses that fig tree, and uh, then he moves on from there. He gets down into the temple area again on Temple Mount. And John, this is when he does the second cleansing of the temple. And I think that's what was happening, um, John. He had been looking around that day before. And his first cleansing of the temple had been his first public Passover in that second phase of his life when he came down for his first ministry Passover when he saw Nicodemus at night. And prior to that, he cleansed the temple. And he looked, I think, and saw it's gotten as bad as ever. And you know what? This house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, but you guys have made it a den of thieves. You've shut down traffic in that court of the Gentiles uh, where the Gentiles were allowed to be, and uh, you have made it all about commerce. You're even moving product through this area. You're restocking. It's just gotten to be mayhem, and it's not at all conducive in terms of uh, what this was supposed to be, a house of prayer for all nations. And Steve, so after you, the yeah, go ahead. Do you, do you think the cleansing actually took place in the broader Gentile court or the royal stoa or the Solomon's portico or porch? Yeah, and John, I don't know how you feel. I feel that, that the the stoa is probably what you're showing there on the mm -hmm. you know the bottom end of that picture there. And I think that was where meeting place and a marketplace, but I think all around, I mean, other authors will talk about um, the columns all around that Temple Mount area and that there could have been shops set up in there, definitely in the court of the Gentiles, um, but a lot of different places. So I think that there was probably, a, do I think he tipped over every, you know, there were seven tables and he knocked them all over. I think there were so many tables and things set mm -hmm. up there and he caused a stir and i think they were spread out all around there and that's what raised his ire again after he had done this a couple of years before this i remember a <laughs> field trip if i can just digress yeah. back to the 80s uh, the royal stella uh, was comprising of uh, 162 pillars and i remember on a field trip to the police station in jerusalem uh steve i think i'm sure we were together Gabi Barkai uh, showed us uh, one of those pillars that apparently broke into two in transport to the temple and was left there. Yes. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, it was about the same size and dimensions as no doubt destined for the temple, but it didn't make it. In fact, uh, it was to the west uh, in Western Jerusalem where the, the police station was actually probably in this area here, but uh I think I think that's where Jesus did uh, not only converse, talk theology, but certainly overthrew the money changers and all the unkosher, non-kosher activity there. But back to the Bethany he goes then, right? Yep, Monday night. Uh, right before he heads back, um, it's interesting when he's at that Temple Mount, a bunch of Greeks want to see him, and it's kind of like, they're telling some of the disciples who tell some of the others who finally get to Jesus. And the interesting thing here is this is when Jesus makes those statements about the hour for him to be glorified, you know, has finally come and talking about a seed falling to the ground and needing to die before it can produce uh, way more seeds in the future. So Monday night, he is back at Bethany again. Tuesday morning starts. And he heads up again to the Mount of Olives. And John, I think you've got a picture that's showing a variety of the summits of the Mount of Olives. And uh, that Mount of Olives is really about one and a half to two miles in total length. And um, it goes you know, primarily north to south. And uh, then Jesus starts to make his way again back to the temple on Tuesday. As he gets to that Mount of Olives, he sees that fig tree that he mm. has cursed the day before is now withered. 
And John, I really think, I mean, what he had done the day before in terms of cleansing the temple again, uh, getting that clean and back to his father's purpose. I mean, he's kind of showing what he did with that object lesson with the fig tree, uh, that Jewish uh, religion with the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a lot of um, practice to it that looked good and a lot of different laws and a lot of different observances. But if it was empty and it wasn't bearing fruit, um, it was not going to stand the test of time. And I think his cursing in the temple, John, was a foreshadowing of what was going to happen in 70 AD when the Romans totally destroyed the temple. That temple has never been rebuilt till this day and destroyed Jerusalem at that time. It was the withering that was going to come to Jerusalem, much like it did to this fig tree. Well, John, he comes back down into the temple area again. And I love this picture there. You see a good visual illustration of the stoa, the red tiled roof on the left side, and then the courts of the Gentiles surrounding the formal temple itself. And then the entrance to the formal temple from the east side going straight on into the temple proper. And uh, he gets down there and you see um, that he's going to have a busy, busy Tuesday. So on this Tuesday, probably from fairly early in the morning, we have what we sometimes call this Mount Olivet Discourse. And that would have been done in the areas out around this temple building. You see the short little fences there kind of representing the inside courts and then the outer courts of the Gentiles where all of the crowds could be. And think about what happened that morning on Tuesday. Well, first off, um, at this point in time, they had come to him and they had said, by what authority are you doing this? And I think they meant, what authority are you doing this triumphal entry? What authority are you letting the children sing your praises? What authority are you turning over the, the commerce in the temple? And Jesus asked them some questions and says, if you answer, I'll give you an answer. And he kind of paints them in a corner and they don't give an answer at all. They know what he's up to. And so at that point in time, Jesus ends up giving, um, you know, some parables and what he's thinking that way. And he shares three parables. And in the end, he basically tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees what he thinks about them. Now, he just ping pongs around this whole Temple Mount area, probably from early Tuesday morning till mid to later afternoon. After this confrontation, you've got the Pharisees and the uh, Herodians, not people that usually work together. And they're coming to him and they're saying, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And they're trying to trick him that way. And Jesus has a coin pulled out and says, whose portrait do you see? You know, give to Caesar's what's Caesar's and God's what's God's. And then he goes from there. And then the Sadducees come on the scene. And they want to talk about resurrection and they want to talk about, you know, um, a man and a woman and marriage and, you know, six husbands and to who does she belong and everything that way. And the funny thing is, here is the Sadducees don't even believe in <laughs> resurrection, but they're just trying to set up a straw man to again try to trick Jesus. And then after that, a uh, Pharisee expert in the law comes to him and he says, tell us what the greatest commandment is. And I don't know if he truly wants to know. I think he just, again, wants to see how Jesus is going to respond. And Jesus says, the greatest is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, it's BOGO. Buy one, get one. I'm going to give you a second <laughs> command for free. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself that way. And uh, that religious leader says, well said, teacher. And Jesus says, you're not too far away. And we sense that through Passion Week, uh, that there are others like uh, Nicodemus and like Joseph of Arimathea that are interested in what Jesus has to say. Well, after that, Jesus gives the seven woes. And man, he's hard at the Pharisees here. And the names that he calls them and, you know, a whitewashed tomb and like a snake and 
And at this point, the gauntlet's laid down. There's no turning back. And I just love, John, that he's doing this on the Pharisees' home turf, as it were, that way. And uh, after that, um, he shares his own sorrow over Jerusalem, much like he'd done on, you know, on Palm Sunday when he came in on the triumphal entry. And again, uh, he understands that uh, Jerusalem has some tough stuff in store, and he's sorry about that. Well, now he's going to head up to the Mount of Olives. And as he heads up to the Mount of Olives late uh, on that Tuesday afternoon, um, he's up there with all of his disciples as they're making their way back to Bethany. And they look back and they go, look at that temple that is so stunning. It's so beautiful. Now, it had been being constructed for well over 40 years, 46 years at this point in time. And there were still building projects around that. And Jesus makes this huge statement on the Mount of Olives, and it's a lengthier portion of scripture. We call it the Mount Olivet Discourse because of its location on the Mount of Olives. And he said, you're not going to see one stone on top of another. That's what's coming in the future here. And the disciples right away, they're going, well, tell us when. Give us more information about this. What's going to be the sign that this is going to happen? And Jesus said, well, first there's going to be birth pains. And he talks about wars and rumors of wars. And he talks about family discord and spiritual discord. But he said, that's just the beginning. And then after that, this thing called the abomination of desolation. And he says, there's going to be false prophets. And there's going to be false teachers and uh, false Christs that pop up during this time. Then he said, then the second coming is going to happen after that. And uh, he goes, now here's the interesting thing. No one knows the day. No one knows the hour. The angels don't know. I don't know. Only the father knows. And John, I found this very intriguing through all the years where, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you. And I remember back in the 60s with late great planet Earth. And I remember in the 80s, it was another time. Um, and that was corresponding to the first 40 years of the birth of the nation of Israel in a generation. And I remember Y2K. And I remember uh, about 10 years after that, another resurgence. And of course, now with what's going on in the world, uh, everyone keeps saying, is this going to be the return of Jesus? This has been going on for 2,000 years, people waiting for that return of Jesus. And we forget that Jesus says, no one knows. Only the Father knows. I don't even know at this point in time. Well, he gives five parables then to teach on watchfulness and on waiting. That fifth one is a, a second parable that he's given, and um, it's on you know money and he, the talents and the, the landowner that's going away, and one servant gets five and one, two, and one, one, and he tells him to go invest. And it's very interesting to me that uh, when he comes back, the five says, look at I've gained five more, two, I've gained two more. The one goes, no, I buried it. You're a hard man, a harsh man, and I didn't want to lose it. And the words Jesus uses there, you're, you are a worthless and lazy servant. And I always look at that at the end of this Mount Olivet discourse where he's going, you know, gang, um, no one knows when I'm going to be returning. So please keep on doing the work that we've been doing together. Keep on building the kingdom you don't know when I'm going to return. So don't take your eyes off the ball. Keep the main thing, the main thing, and not just kind of what your prophetic interests are going to be. And so he gets done with that. And um, he closes off that Mount Olivet discourse. And he gives us some simple little lessons there, John, that I think are are very encouraging. I mean, all the way through, he's saying, keep watch, be on your guard, be alert. If you read that Mount Olivet discourse, you will see those words so many different times rolling through the text that way. And so be ready, be alert, be on your guard. I think that's one of the main lessons. Another one is no one knows. So don't waste your time trying to figure all of that out. A third lesson, get on with the work that I gave you to do, just like that last parable with the servants. Whether you got five or two or one talent, don't bury it. 
keep working, keep building the kingdom as I've challenged you to do. And then the fourth lesson is if you do that, your kingdom reward, it's going to await you when I do return. So some great teaching and some great lessons on the Mount Olivet Discourse. And he's back to Bethany for the night. So there is the Mount of Olives and the summits. And on the other side is Bethpage. And a little further out east is Bethany. Today, that's a massive Jewish cemetery with hundreds of thousands of Jews there. And again, another perspective as we understand somewhere on that western slope of the Mount of Olives is where Jesus shared these important words about the end times. I love this picture. It's not mine, but uh, credit to CBN Ministries, uh, an olive tree as we look back towards the Temple Mount. Of course, replace the Dome of the Rock with the Grand Temple that we saw in that 1 to 50 scale model uh, that is displayed uh, about Second Temple Jerusalem at the Israel Museum. And John, that picture that you're just showing, I love that picture because uh, it just kind of gives me the idea of what the disciples would have been looking back and saying, yeah. it is so marvelous and wonderful. And Jesus is saying, here's what's going to happen, boys. And so, yeah. Now we get Tuesday night, all of Wednesday, Wednesday night, John, about 24 hours, we have hardly anything written. This is kind of the quiet day. I think this is Jesus back at his favorite town, place that he could find rest and respite with close friends. And uh, he knew what was going to be coming uh, when Thursday started. And you don't, so you don't think he went into Jerusalem that day? I don't think he went into Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, the texts don't give us any indication of that. I think there are three main events probably in these 24 hours when he got back on Tuesday night till Wednesday night. Um, there was the plot by the Sanhedrin to say, let's get rid of Jesus. Let's arrest and kill him. But the problem was they said, there's too many people around. We don't think we can do it now. So they're going to start to make a plan. And maybe at the end of the time, when people start heading home, little did they know that Judas would present them with an opportunity the following day. And then the second thing, Mary is anointing Jesus' feet for burial. I don't know if that was Tuesday night or Wednesday night, but I think it was one of those nights. Mm. And again, in preparation for the Passover meal and then Jesus heading to the cross. And then during that time, probably on Wednesday, um, and I think that's maybe one of the reasons why Judas could have gotten away um, because he wasn't traveling. And I think Jesus was laying low and just kind of resting a little bit, his final rest before the arduous last journey to the cross the last few days. And that's when he went in and made arrangements to betray Jesus. Now Thursday happens. And Thursday, they wake up in Bethany again. And uh, Jesus, at that point in time, sends a couple of his disciples ahead. And you've got the arrow showing that. Um, up to the uh, upper room, and many scholars think that that was in what was titled and labeled the Essene Quarter, maybe could have even been an Essene guest house, and we think that because you remember the text, um, they say, well, where are we going to find a place, and he goes, uh, follow the man with the water jar, and he'll show you. Now, we know all through biblical history, women they were the ones carrying the water jars. It mm. wasn't the men. But if this was this Essene community, it was primarily men with maybe some servants and some things like that. He was probably getting water down at the Pool of Siloam at the lower part of that picture that you have there and uh, walking up those side streets back to the Essene guest house. And that's where the events of the upper room took mm. place. So Jesus, I think, would have sent them in there earlier in the after, earlier in the morning, John. And it's so funny. This is how scripture always kind of crystallizes some events in a short phrase or a statement. And all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they say, and so they prepared the Passover. They prepared the Passover. They prepared the Passover without us understanding 
Well, they would have gone to the upper room and they would have made sure they had all of the menu items. And then they would have gone and taken a lamb down to the temple and they would have had that lamb uh, sacrifice uh, killed by a priest and a priest would have slit its throat and another would have caught the blood from that lamb uh, and they would have sprinkled that on the altar. And then that lamb uh, would have all been cut up and the disciples, the two of them would have brought it back to the upper room and they would have put it on a spit on a grill, either basted with olive oil or some kind of wine or whatever their creation was. And that would have cooked for about three, four hours as those two disciples got all of the other elements of the meal together. And then we know that Jesus and the other disciples did not join them until the evening because the gospels say when evening came when evening came when it was dark then jesus and the 12 arrived we know it wasn't i mean two of the 12 had already gone in and taken care of this so now we get actually to what's happening in the upper room here and john you want to talk a little bit about this now and then i'll come back and talk a little bit about the upper room discourse yeah, uh, a question first for you. The Essenes operated on a different calendar, as I understand, than the Pharisees and the religious people. So I guess I've always understood, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the Essenes uh, celebrated Passover a day early. Is that the position you would hold as well? Yeah, that's from my reading. That's what I've understood that also. Mm -hmm. Um and yet, when you read the synoptics and you count the six days before the Passover, I do think this was on a Thursday night. I don't yeah. think they were working in a scene calendar. And then when John weighs in, sometimes John is using Roman time more than Jewish time. Yeah. So there it's you've confusing got there. things colliding right there. Well, this is the upper room. It's only a traditional a location, if you will, a, a specific spot. Uh, it can't be the upper room because it's n more or less a crusader building, which yeah. means archaeologically we're uh, only here preserving the story of the, the Last Supper, the, the Passover meal. I love this Bible illustrated display of Jesus sharing uh, this meal with his disciples. Uh, but just know that many groups, and maybe you are one of them, if you're watching this video, if you've been to Jerusalem and you typically would go to places like the Upper Room and even, uh, as we'll talk about it in just a moment, the House of Caiaphas. Both of these locations are simply traditional, but perhaps preserving at least the right area of the city, the upper part of the city. But the upper room was where Jesus shares his Passover meal. Tell us a little about what was included in the Passover meal. Well, and you see there the matzah, the unleavened bread when they left Egypt, um, where they didn't even have time to let the bread rise. And uh, you see the um, the egg and you see the bitter herb and you see like a compote of fruit and walnuts kind of represented um you know as they were in egypt and as they were building and making bricks and mortar and stuff like that and so all of these were elements probably four glasses of wine at different times and this passover meal john would have been three to four hours in length hmm. So if Jesus is starting this meal around, um, you know, seven at night, right when it's dark, when it's evening time is coming, they're probably finishing between 10 and 11. This is an unhurried, unrushed meal. I know you and I have both uh, had been part of Passover seders before and all of the rich symbolism. And Jesus, as they are having this meal, um, the guys start talking again about who's the greatest. And then he washes the disciples' feet. And then Judas is identified as the betrayer, and Judas leaves. And then Jesus talks about someone's going to deny him and Peter. And then that Passover meal that morphs into the Lord's Supper, as you mm -hmm. have that illustrated right here. And as Jesus would have been talking about that Passover meal and 
talking in terms of some of those verses that we get out of, you know, first Corinthians. Um, then when he talked about his body and blood, that would have been a big change. That would have been a new introduction, something that um, those followers would not have normally heard in all of the Passover seders that they had been part of before. And then, John, we get that amazing section of scripture, one of my favorite ones, John 13 to uh, 14 to 17, and Jesus is talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit, the vine and the branches, and all the way through there, he's talking about, you know, no fruit, fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and fruit that will last, John 15. He gives a continuum of fruit, and he says, we're going to know your disciples by the fruit you bear. This is what's important. It's not all the rules. It's not all the legalism. It's not observing every command. It's the fruit that you bear. This was so important to Jesus. And then he talked about the fact that there is going to be opposition from the world. And he also talked in terms of the promise uh, of answered prayer and that peace would be coming uh, even in the midst of this world that's going to bring trouble. And then John 17, his high priestly prayer. And there have been so many sermons written on that, but really in there you can see he's asking for unity among them. He's asking for protection as they're in the world because he doesn't want them retreating from the world. He doesn't want an Essene you know, approach where you're out in the desert um, at Qumran. And besides then the unity and protection, he talks about, those that will know because of you. And he talks about fruit again there too. So unity, protection, fruit, three big themes that come out of John 17. The end of that, they're singing a song and they're leaving the uh, upper room in the Essene quarter. And they are going out, probably the gate down by the uh, Salome pool that you see there, and then working their way up the Kidron Valley and they're ending up at Gethsemane. Now, this would have been, uh, John, like I'm saying, maybe 11, 12 o'clock that night. Hmm. In our terminology in the West here, late, late Thursday night, early Friday morning in Jewish time, of course, we would have already tipped into Friday um, with sunset uh, coming up that day. And so, now you see the picture there and Jesus agonizing prayer three different times, the angels that are attending him, the disciples that are falling asleep. And then uh, at the end of that um, time, uh, as he's praying, he's finally um, arrested. Here you see some great shots of Gethsemane today. And what a, it's a beautiful place, a very uh, wonderful and a quiet place. And then... We get to early Friday morning, our time on Friday morning, and now Jesus is arrested by a whole cohort, a whole group, a combination of Roman soldiers and of temple precinct soldiers, Jewish uh, precinct soldiers. And they come down and he goes, why did you have to come here? You've seen me in the temple all these days. And of course, Judas steps forward and Jesus says, whatever you have to do, do quickly. <laughs> And uh, Jesus kisses him. And even in the midst of that, Jesus calls him friend, uh, knowing what's coming at that point in time. Well, after he's arrested, he's taken back down the Kidron Valley and he's taken in that gate right at the very bottom uh, with the tower right outside the Pool of Siloam. He goes up one of those streets that you can see with the alleyways and the streets going to the upper city. And you can still see some of those today. And he's heading up to, at this point, Caiaphas's house. And uh, he gets to Caiaphas's house. And John, this is St. Peter in Galicantu. Again, another traditional site. I'm not sure if you want to make any comments here. Well, we look for archaeological ruins that perhaps indicate that this was uh, uh, from the days of Jesus. Now, from my understanding, the only true first century ruin is the the pavement, the the street that comes. Actually, let me just go back here. Uh, it goes about in this direction. Uh, first century pavement that was found that came from the lower part of the city. But uh, today, uh, this church, while it does preserve uh, the place where Jesus was bound, as well as uh, where Peter denied Jesus. 
as you'll talk about, Steve, in a moment. Um, I don't think uh, archaeologically uh, we can say that this is the house, and and really for good reasons. Why would the high priest, the most important religious leader, live so far south <laughs> uh, of the Temple Mount? Uh, I would think that the the true house of Caiaphas was uh, perhaps where the Jewish quarter is today within the old city, or even uh, there's a Herodian mansion that we sometimes visit, as well as some new excavations by Shimon Gibson, actually, uh, in what we call Mount Zion today. But nonetheless, uh, it's a great place, I think, uh, Steve, to understand what Jesus endured here at the house of Caiaphas while uh, bound by this high priest. Yeah, and when he came um, at after he was arrested, John, I see three different phases to that Jewish trial. You read in John, and he meets first with Annas, who had been high priest before. And I see that more like the arraignment. With Passover coming up, I think Annas wanted to make sure Jesus didn't have blood on his hands that would have made any of the religious leaders ceremonially unclean. So you've got Annas first, and then he goes to Caiaphas and some of the Sanhedrin, because they're starting to come together now. And I picture this, John, as uh, really pretty early in the morning. It's mm. nighttime. This isn't a regular meeting. And uh, that's when the trial, and they're asking Jesus all of these questions. And then pretty much the whole rest of the Sanhedrin, and I don't know if that was in the temple. There was an area of the temple that um, supposedly the Sanhedrin met in, in one of the side rooms. Um, but I've heard different uh, viewpoints on that, and I don't have a strong viewpoint one way or another. Yeah. But that's when they gave the final verdict. And uh, in the midst of all of that, uh, probably during that trial period when they were gathering, that's when Peter made his denial. And uh, it talks about Peter warming himself by the fire and people recognizing his distinctive you know, Galilean accent, and of course him saying that he never uh, knew that man, and then the cock crows three times, and St. Peter and Galicantu really translate St. Peter with the cock crowing. Mm. So these pictures are really the traditional place where Jesus was placed, maybe in a, what was a cistern? Uh, this is deemed to be uh, where he was bound. And uh, then I, th yeah. I think this is pretty powerful, Steve. Uh, I do too. Uh, just actually that? right behind, right here, I think is part of that first century pavement that comes up from the lower city. But uh, look at the proximity here. We're so far south from the Temple Mount there. You can see the southern end of the Temple Mount. But nonetheless, uh, what do you think Peter was thinking? I mean, he denied Jesus here. Just think of the remorse, the, the sadness, the disappointment in himself. It must have been just soul-gripping for him. John, especially after the fact that, you know, less than 12 hours before, eight hours before, he's saying, it will never be me. Right. I won't do this. It won't be me at all. So, yeah. So where does uh, Jesus then go? At next? that point in time, yeah, they send him because they're determining that he's going to be killed, but they can't um, extend the death sentence. It has to be the Romans. And so um, you'll see three circles on here, John, and those are three um, potential locations for the praetorium that the Gospels talk about. The one on the top, Antonio, that had been the one in favor for, you know, many decades, I mean, centuries even, and saying at the fortress, that's, uh, and we know the fortress was there, but archaeology showed us a few decades ago that that archaeology that they were pointing to and looking at was really from 135 AD, the time of Hadrian, and could not have been during the time of Jesus. And nowadays, I know a lot of people like that Herod's upper palace. I think that's a great candidate. 
I've also uh, noted the Praetorium listed in the center there, and you referenced that a little bit ago and said, you know, one of the Hasmonean palaces. When Herod the Great took over, he hadn't built that upper palace. I think he inherited that Hasmonean palace, much like he inherited some of those palaces down in Jericho that were built by the Hasmoneans before him, and he married into the Hasmonean family. And um, I always like what Bargill Pixner, who was a priest, a scholar, an archaeologist, historian, and he always said the problem that he has with Herod's upper palace is there were never any early traditions for that as being the location. Now, there's some archaeology, and I'm going to have you talk about that in a minute, John, but he said the early traditions really had, a, they talked about a church that was early established called Pilate's Church, hmm. and then that name got changed to uh, Sophia, the Wisdom Church. Only by the wisdom of God would he allow his son uh, to go through what he was going to go through. And John, both that the remains of those are in a yeshiva right down by that Hasmonean palace uh, on that previous slide. And he talks about even all the early liturgies that talked about that location. And so I think that location, I know a lot of people love Herod's upper palace, the one that Herod the Great built. I think they're both good valid candidates. I like the fact that the Hasmonean Palace could have been one because of the early traditions, and there are no traditions that I've come across from early years uh, in terms of written tradition, lexicon, anything like that, that reference that upper palace. But I think they're both valid, and I know a lot has been written, and most scholars recently will look at Herod's upper mm -hmm. palace as the praetorium, the location of, um, you know, Pilate's uh, forces and everything. In fact, this model from the Israel Museum, uh, I call them the two gazebo type structures. That's the, the location of the Hasmonean Palace that you're referring to. And that makes sense because it's proximity to what is today the Western Wall of the Temple. There's the Holy Chamber of the Temple. But here on the Western upper part of the city, uh, there's the Western uh, Wall, not the Western Wall of the Temple, but uh, inside what today is Jaffa Gate, marked by three towers, Hippicus, Faziel, and Miriam, I believe. One of the foundations of those uh, towers is still seen today, but here is the uh, the palace as represented at the museum. But uh, is this where Jesus was brought to Pilate? Now, Pilate, as you know, Steve was uh, in Caesarea and coming to Jerusalem during the Passover. But uh, I really am intrigued by this new theory that just outside the Western Wall, which is primarily a, a Turkish wall from the Ottomans in, built in 1537 AD, but we do have an example, not these two structures, these are from later periods, but right here, a few steps that are first century, and uh, Shimon Gibson is one of the leading archaeologists who promote that there was what is called a hidden gate here. And of course, the gate is no longer there because of the later Turkish wall. Uh, but there is evidence that there was a gate there and even a place where some would suggest Pilate came out of because right behind of this wall is the palace that we just saw. He came out of this gate. Uh, walked to this area where uh, there was a position for him of royalty, and uh, compliments and credit to Archaeology Illustrated, this is where Jesus was brought out of the palace, of the praetorium, out of this gate that's, of course, no longer there, and then presented before the chief priests, the religious leaders, the Jewish uh, leaders of the temple, which would include the Sanhedrin, and Pilate then here presented Jesus to them, sentencing him to crucifixion. And then right after in that text of John 19, in fact, John 19 mentions what is called the lithostratus in Greek. It's called the stone pavement. Uh, some would believe that the stone pavement was 
where Jesus was presented to the Jewish uh, Jewish community who who could of course could not go into the palace because of purification reasons, but uh, Pilate sentenced Jesus here, and then the text tells us he went back into the palace where he secured uh, his part of the cross uh, to Calvary. So this is one position, and uh, today uh, that area would be just to the right of where I'm pointing, uh, but right inside the Jaffa Gate is the area suggested to be Herod's palace, whereas this area, let's see if I'm pointing to it right, pretty much here, right, Steve? Yep. Would yep. be where the Hasmonean Palace would be. So take your pick. I think both are, are good candidates. But uh, from after being sentenced, whether it was here or here, Jesus then goes to the place of crucifixion. I'm pointing to this gray dome, uh, tell us a little about this gray dome before we see a few more pictures about it. Well, John, that's uh, what we now know today as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this is really an interesting, I mean, it's hard for people if you don't understand. I tell people the lesson you have to learn about the city of Jerusalem is the walls were always changing. And there you see, no matter which place was the praetorium, it ended up there. There's another candidate, which is the garden tomb, but both you and I archaeologically would lean much more to this location. And um, yeah, uh, when you look at that, John, that's what I wanted you to show and talk a little bit about this, because now we just see church building after church building in six different uh, denominations that share hmm. that church, and it doesn't give you any idea of a quarry like it would have been, a place where a brand new tomb could have been cut. So make a couple comments about that, John. Yeah, well, this was a quarry. We do know that there were uh, a number, at least a couple dozen, what we call Second Temple tombs found deep down in the lower areas of the quarry. It was outside the city wall, which was, of course, uh, standard. If you were a Jew, you were course, uh, burying your dead, not in the city, but outside the city. So uh, this uh, illustration places the crosses here on a prominent uh, road or pathway that would have led into uh, what today is called the, the seventh station of the cross and the tomb of Jesus here. Uh, but uh, the tomb itself perhaps looked like this. We do know that there's only a few examples of rolling stones in channels that have been found archaeologically, but uh, it very well could have been a, a squarish uh, plug stone that would have sealed the tomb. Uh, inside this tomb would have been a bench uh, and um, perhaps uh, different customs of burial in the days of Jesus included more niche tombs called Kokim tombs, but uh, we're going to suggest that Joseph of Arimathea had a more, uh, a larger tomb and maybe a, a tomb that marked his affluence. So perhaps a tomb like this or an arcosolium where the body of Jesus would have been placed. Now we're not big, you and I, I'm sure Steve, are in, uh, on dogmatically placing uh, the the tomb and of course the, the crucifixion, which one of the gospels says was nearby, uh, here at the Holy Sepulchre Church. The bottom line is that uh, the tomb was rolled away, or the stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty. And uh, wow, that rejoicing moment of not only Peter and John running to the tomb after the women go and tell them, but what a splendid! and exciting experience this must have been, encountering the angels and uh, now realizing that Jesus, who died, is now well alive. Yeah, what a change, John, from that Saturday. I mean, Jesus in the tomb by sunset on Friday night, the start of Sabbath, 
Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, 75 pounds of aloe and myrrh and spices mixed together. I mean, that's a lot wrapped up in a shroud that way. Saturday, um, it says the women, you know, worshiped as was their custom, but that's also when the Jewish leader said, hey, we need a we need some soldiers assigned there. And Pilate said, go and do what you want to do. And then Resurrection Sunday. That Saturday had to be one of the loneliest days for those Jesus followers. I think it's the only time in the history of the earth where no one thought Jesus was alive. Mm -hmm. um, and they had to wait until that Resurrection Sunday. And this shows those women coming from that empty tomb. And then we get the resurrection appearances, at least five of them, John, on that Sunday. And the first resurrection appearance would have been to Mary. Remember when she thinks she's talking to the gardener. And then the other women would have been a second one as they are back. And then um, the third one was on the road to Emmaus. And Emmaus is a small little town. How far do you figure that's outside of Jerusalem, John, the road to Emmaus, uh, where Emmaus was? Well, Emmaus uh, was seven miles, although some scholars would think that the Gospels, and I forget the number of stadia, but uh, some would suggest it was three and a half miles out and three back, three and a half back, or seven out and seven back. But there's a number of uh, locations. In fact, uh, I think about 10 or so. Um, compliments and credit to Jerusalem Perspective. Great ministry, by the way, who teach a lot of the Hebraic roots of Jesus. Uh, this picture really displays what's maybe left of what was the Emmaus Road, and uh, what an encounter this must have been on the way to Emmaus, whether that would be today uh, Abu Ghosh or a place called Kirya Ya'arim in the Old Testament or Motza, uh, but uh, the encounter with the risen Lord, with these two people whose eyes were open once Jesus broke bread. I think that's significant as well with uh, uh, the tremendous uh, level of joy and enthusiasm now, knowing that they were talking to of the risen Lord. Well, those guys rushed back to Jerusalem, to the upper room, where I assume the disciples had been hanging out. And um, they tell them, we've seen Jesus. And they also make a statement, He and he appeared to Peter. The Gospels don't tell us where or when that was, but mm. it definitely had to be before um, they got back to Jerusalem because they're the ones conveying it to the rest of the disciples. Of course, Judas is dead and Thomas is not with them on the eve of Resurrection Sunday. And that's the fifth appearance then to the disciples, the, the 10 plus some of the other followers. And interesting, when Jesus comes back, he says, you know, peace uh, be with you. And he says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And that had been what he'd been working with them on all the way from phase three, four, and five. Um, I need you to get out there in the harvest field, and I'm going to send you. And then a week later, John, they're still probably in the upper room, and uh, John 20 talks about a week later, and Thomas was with them, and now Thomas gets a chance to see the risen Jesus. And at that point in time, I mean, Jesus is giving another commission to those disciples. And he said, go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. So the second time he gives them a great commission. And then he heads up to the Galilee. And you've got the pictures out here. And it's interesting because in the upper room, he said, I'm going to meet you later in the Galilee. <laughs> To the women after the resurrection, he said, tell the disciples to meet me in the Galilee. Hmm. And I think he wanted to make one of those resurrection appearances back up in his ministry hometown area in the Capernaum off the Sea of Galilee. I think he had all those disciples there that uh, he chose his 12 apostles from. And that was the area he'd ministered in and had become his ministry hometown. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about his resurrection appearances, and in there it says, and he appeared to 500 all at one time. John, I think it might have been that 
that time frame in here when he's appearing to all them back where he ministered the among them so that much. Makes sense. Yeah. And you have John 21 and you've got the guys that are out fishing. And this is so Peter, Jesus hadn't traveled up there with them and they'd been waiting for a few days. And uh, he finally says, let's go fish. And I don't know if he was hungry. I don't know if he needed to pay the rent. I don't know if this was muscle memory, but seven guys go fishing. Again, they don't catch anything. And uh, then all of a sudden they hear a voice from the shore. We talk about the last supper. I call this the last breakfast on John 21. And you asked earlier, what do you think Peter felt when he sat around that charcoal fire uh, at Caiaphas's house when he denied Jesus. Here, Jesus has a charcoal fire going with fish on it that he's cooking. And these are the only two times in the Gospels that idea of a charcoal fire is used. And I think Jesus is saying the last time, you know, we were around a fire, it was totally something that kind of had to be, a, you know, a spear in your in your heart, in your spirit. But this time I'm going to recommission you and I'm going to say, you know, feed my sheep, feed my flocks, feed my lamb. So John 21 and right after this up in the galley is the famous Matthew 28 passage. And that's his third great commission where he says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me and therefore go and make disciples of all nations and uh, baptizing him in the name of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything to obey that I've commanded. John, what are we looking at here? Well, I was going to uh, actually ask you, because we were uh, in the vicinity of what today is called Peter primacy. Uh, perhaps uh, you can share, because uh, I don't I forget if I have a, a, a photo of Arbel next or not, but uh, yeah, you talked about that. Well, part of this was, when he was, it says he set the table for them and Mensa Christi is the table of Christ. And yeah. so this is the traditional site where he would have been with those loaves and fishes. And they have built this chapel around the rock there. And it's a beautiful location, but the location is much more beautiful for, again, the restoration of Peter that way. I guess I don't now, have a picture of, of, of our bell. Excuse me, Steve. Yep. Uh, but I I always teach that, of course, when it said uh, the disciples met Jesus on a mountain, why not Arbel overlooking the entire landscape of where Jesus served? Uh, and maybe that was where he heard go and make disciples, uh, or when Jesus shared that with his disciples, that great commission, how inspiring that must have been to view uh, really all of the, the the lake basin, the Sea of Galilee area uh, with those remarkable words. Well, I think there could probably be at least four locations for that, John, talking about the mountain. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of those is Mount Hermon. And I don't think that's valid at all because uh, I hear some people say that because of what Jesus had done at Mount Hermon mm -hmm. and uh, the transfiguration, but that wasn't in the Galilee. Some will say Mount Tabor, um, others will say, uh, our bell and I like our bell a lot. And I also like the Mount of Beatitudes when it said he went up on a mountain, um, and, you know, spent the night in prayer. And if that's where he chose the 12 and gave their ordination message, which I think it was, could that also be, um, you know, others will even say a fifth location. They'll go around Bethsaida when he went up on the mountain there and he fed the 5,000 afterwards, went up on the mountain to pray. I think my best two options are Mount of Beatitudes and Mount Arbel. Yeah. I wonder if it was when he met 500 people, could all 500 have climbed up to Mount Arbel? I know <laughs> you always have your groups climb up on your tours. It's a highlight for everyone that does that with your tours. Yeah. And, uh, I think if it could have been the 500, would that have been the most logical place in the Galilee when 1 Corinthians talks about that? Would he have taken them all the way there or up, up that steep slope or would he have gone to where he called the 12 from his disciples? That's, that's my lean. Yeah. But one last time, Jesus returns to Jerusalem. And he goes to Jerusalem, and here we get the fourth of his great commissions, and this one's by Luke. 
And uh, Luke says that Christ will suffer, rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And then right after that, Acts, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. And so, John, really interesting to me, um, 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. This is when Jesus ascended, right after that Acts comment, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Final words matter. In those 40 days, we don't see him doing any big, broad teaching. We see the John 21 uh, conversation with bringing Peter back into the fold. But all four Gospels and the book of Acts each give a great commission. And his final words are, you guys have got to be about making disciples. I want you, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. You guys need to go out and bear much more fruit. So we've looked at this chronology, and we've got four key challenges at different times that I think we need to be thinking about as we work with making disciples. We challenge people to come and see. We say, follow me as I follow Christ. We say, follow and fish. Let's get in the harvest field. Let's change the identity from what's in it for me as a consumer Christian to how can I be involved out in the harvest field and transforming other people's lives through the power of the Spirit. And then at the end of this time, go make disciples. These are the final words of mm. Jesus. Each of the Gospels and the book of Acts, this is his message, final words matter. And he gives us the challenges that we need to live by today. 1 John 2, 6 is one of my favorite verses of Scripture. Whoever wants to live like him must walk as Jesus walked. Hmm. And walking as Jesus walked is in the power of the Spirit, and it's looking at the Word, and it's listening to the Father and interceding in prayer. And we have all of those resources available to us, just like Jesus did. And now he promises his authority, his presence, and his power through those great commissions. That's how we live like Jesus. This has been incredible, Steve. Uh, you've walked us through really in the previous two sessions from Bethlehem all the way to Jerusalem, and now this last week of Christ, even extending into the galley and coming back. And uh, can you picture uh, somewhere on the range of the Mount of Olives, uh, Luke 24 suggests, I believe it was more in the vicinity, maybe in the eastern slopes near Bethany, but look at yep. the Mount of Olives today. And uh, I think we would be amiss, Steve, not to mention that Zechariah 14, as Jesus yes. ascended to heaven on the Mount of Olives, somewhere on this slope, uh, the prophet Zechariah says he's coming back as well. Yes. And his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and it will split into two. And what uh, what an event that will be. I guess I'm a, lo uh, a loss of words there, because in God's perfect and sovereign timing, this will happen. Christ will return. The world will know it. He will be proclaimed King of kings and Lord of lords, and uh, the world will know that God's in charge and has the final word. Every knee will bow. Yep. What a great uh, teaching there, Steve. Any closing comments before we uh, end this session on the chronology of Jesus? Nope, I think I already gave them. We need to live those four challenges. We need to live with his authority and with his presence. He's going to be with us always till the end of the age and with his power through the Holy Spirit. We've got to live sent. We've got to make disciples. And the same authority that Jesus displayed, uh, it just comes to mind, this smekha is the word. He displayed yep. it in so many ways through his teaching, uh, through his miracles, and yet we now possess that same authority to go and make disciples and make a difference, a redemptive difference uh, in the world uh, through the Spirit. So thanks, Steve, so much. What a great uh, teaching. Again, uh, I've learned a lot from you and to place uh, the steps one after another of Jesus' ministry, especially here in Jerusalem it's been uh, really a great time with you. So thanks for sharing your time 
uh, with with me and our audience today, and uh, uh, we'll certainly post more uh, series sessions, I should say, uh, within this series uh, coming up soon. So I hope that you tune in again to uh, a few more in this series on the life of Christ in context. So thanks for tuning in, my friends, and until next time, shalom.